Science is an incredible way to understand the world. In the past, people thought that if they used common sense, trial and error, or taking advice, they could find answers to important questions. They didn't actually do experiments. They didn't observe, write it down, and test ideas. This interview with Professor Peter Doherty explores the meaning of science, the excitement and the joy of science, especially as a career. Peter, it's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure. You've said in your book that science teachers are enormously important and we should value them and pay them highly. Science teachers are massively important because they, they bring us all, hopefully, to the idea that reality is important and that evidence is important and that there is such a thing as an evidence-based world, not, a belief, not just a belief-based world. What for you has been the biggest advance in producing new vaccines for the developing world? There have been a number of recent advances in vaccination for developing countries. One has been the international rollout of the poliomyelitis vaccine with the aim of eliminating polio. Another one would be the rotavirus vaccine for children to prevent diarrheal disease in countries like India. And uh, last but not least, of course, is the rollout of the human papillomavirus vaccine, which prevents cervical cancer uh, in women as uh, they get older. You say that uh, when people win Nobel Prizes, society's attention uh, is focused on rational, evidence-based inquiry. Would you like to reflect on, on the importance of how science interacts with society? Yes, the Nobel Prizes uh, get science on the, on the news, in the newspaper at least one day a year uh, because they're a kind of an event. I mean, they're a celebrity event, if you like. The values that are expressed in the Nobel Prizes are the values that relate to evidence-based inquiry and relate basically to the idea of, of human populations living well together. That's why there's a Peace Prize, for instance. And if we think about the factors that are creating major issues for uh, human long-term survival, if you like, then we would need to focus on what's happening in the natural world at the moment. We would need to focus on the issue of climate change, environmental degradation. Uh, we have an issue that uh, we have a global population which has increased massively and very quickly. There are now three times more people on the planet than there were when I was born in 1940. That has created enormous stresses, and we're seeing that across society at the moment, uh, particularly the stress points are related to things like immigration, uh, jobs, uh, security, and uh, we're seeing some rather unfortunate moves towards more repressive political systems, which are really quite dangerous. And so if we, we deny the science of these issues, we tend to make wrong decisions. And those wrong decisions will be based on authoritarian dogmas rather than a genuine understanding. That's a real danger for democracy. What's it like being a scientist and doing experiments in the lab? The modern scientific laboratory, uh, if, it, if it's a good lab, is generally a pretty social place. Uh, people work together at close quarters. It's very informal. Uh, they depend on each other, so they depend on trust. And it can be a very nice social environment, actually. You've written that the Royal Society has a Latin uh, motto, nilius in verba, nothing by words alone, meaning you've got to do the experiment. Tell us more about that. The, the beginnings of science really date back to, to the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. There was a whole movement in Europe, the Renaissance, the Reformation. And then in Britain, uh, the philosopher Francis Bacon formulated the basic idea that you have to look at the thing itself, not look at what people have written or what people have proposed or their f philosophical thoughts. 
uh, about what life is, but actually look at life itself and, and, and do the, the world experiment. itself. Do the experiment, make the measurement, come to the conclusions, publish it. The Nobel e-museum, which of course is online, has some fantastic illustrations and reconstructions of experiments which people have done, which led to a Nobel Prize. What was your favourite? Yes, one of the favourites, if you're looking at the Nobel e-museum, just go to nobel.org and you can get to uh, biographical accounts uh, written by all the Nobel Prize winners that talks about their lives. And you'll find their lives may not be that different from yours. And you can also go to their Nobel lectures where they describe what they actually did. The one I particularly love is the accounts by Ronald Ross, who, who uh, got the Nobel Prize for work, for work he did as a, as a medical doctor in India, working out the life cycle of the malaria parasite, which he actually did in birds for various reasons. If you read his Nobel lecture, it reads as fresh as it would if it were describing someone doing science today. But the basic process he went through, the various frustrations and so forth, uh, are just like reading the account of a scientist uh, uh, that's contemporary. It's a lot of fun and he's a great character. Can I ask you to comment on some of the one or more of the successful women who've come through in the last century and won Nobel Prizes or done great scientific work? In my particular field of microbiology, women have long been rather prominent. One of the few to win two Nobel Prizes is, of course, uh, Marie Curie, who worked on radiation early on and eventually died from the consequences of radiation. Two weeks ago, I was in Lindau, where there's a meeting that involves Nobel laureates and mixes them together with young scientists. And one of the people there was Elizabeth Blackburn. Elizabeth went to University High School in Melbourne. She graduated in biochemistry, and she shared the Nobel Prize for the uh, discovery of telomerase. An outstanding scientist and very, uh, very dedicated uh, to, uh, to advancing the careers of women in science. You talk about how young scientists should have fun and to do alcohol and mountain climbing in moderation. <laughs> yes, um, that's, uh, that's a bit facetious, but um, I think you need to live a life. Uh, the idea that scientists are just uh, dedicated drones who spend all their lives in laboratories is a pretty dismal one. And it doesn't actually reflect the life of many scientists. Uh, I know scientists who are very active in, in jazz bands. There, is, there are scientists who climb mountains. In fact, my colleague Rolf Zinkenagel, who shared the Nobel Prize with me, is spending a lot of time very high on mountains in, uh, in Switzerland and uh, Bolivia and all sorts of places. It looks very fit as a consequence. Peter, you wrote in your book, everyone can achieve a measure of scientific literacy. Can you talk about that some more? What I would like to see is, a, is an appreciation uh, through the educational process that the basics of science, uh, looking at uh, probability, at relative risk, are tremendously important for us. How would you encourage high school students to do science? Some high school students will go on to do science and they'll find, find a career in that direction. Others will enter professions which are very science-based. But I think also that for the rest of us, it, it's important to have that, that, that idea uh, of, of, of a science basis to life, if you like, of an evidence base to life. And that, whether we, we study the arts or the sciences as our primary interest, I think we need to keep some balance between these two situations. What is it about science that's driven you forward for decades? My, my life in science has been around the, the area of infectious disease. And that's particularly fascinating because of the complexity of the situation and the unpredictability of it, really. Research in biology is, has a long way to go. That's less true of physics. We understand a lot of physics and chemistry because these are based in physical laws. But with biology, biology is based in evolution and because its uh, biological systems evolve, they're extremely complex. It's those, that unpredictability that makes biological research, particularly in infectious disease, so exciting because you turn up things that you totally don't expect. Modern science is very specialised. 
But you have written that the basic nature of scientific inquiry is straightforward and accessible. Please tell us some more about that. Yes, the basic nature of science inquiry is really straightforward. All it is to do with looking is looking at the thing itself, not looking at it through the prism of some dogma or some pre set of prejudices that you may have, but try and break everything back down to the basics. And the way we do that is we ask a question, we have a hypothesis about some natural phenomenon we might be studying, and then we make measurements and we analyze those measurements, then we write them up and we publish them so that other people can critique them, see whether they can repeat them and whether the conclusions are valid. And it's a really very simple process. This was set up in the 17th century, uh, initially by the Royal Society of London, which is the first uh, big scientific academy in the English speaking world. And that's what's guided science ever since. I love what you said, that there's nothing wrong with changing one's mind when better evidence becomes available. That's the nature of science, that we, we have a hypothesis, we, we get to the best point we can from the evidence we can gather at the time. But what often happens is we get a, a better idea or we get better technology, and it's often better technology. It, it allows us, there's a wonderful word in the, in the uh, in the Christian Bible about a wonderful phrase about seeing through a glass darkly in part and then you see more clearly. And that's often the case with science when we get a better instrumentation or a better technology to approach the question. And I've had that experience several times during my career where we've interpreted the results we had, come to the best possible conclusion at the time, but that conclusion turned out not to be right. And the reason it turned out not to be right is because we weren't seeing clearly enough. So one of the things that politicians and journalists hate about scientists is that we always qualify what we say. We say, uh, look, this is from what we can measure, from what we understand, this is our best possible understanding. That's not what they want to hear. They want to hear a dogmatic position, which they can then uh, sell or, or adhere to in their thinking. But, but that's not the way science works. We work from evidence. If the evidence changes or if we get better evidence, we'll change our, our opinion. So anyone in science has to be pretty robust emotionally, quite frankly, because we do fail a lot. If you are not failing, then you're not asking something new. You're just doing me too science. Peter Doherty, thank you very, very much. Hi. It's been a pleasure.